key, the Keisha Cole record, Love. Yes. Right. And and um um Star and Buck Wild had their show in New York when that record was hot. Yeah. And they used to play that record every morning. I would listen to the show every morning. Yeah. And I hated it. The first 30 or 40 times I heard it, I'm like, and they playing this as a joke? Like, this chick can barely sing. Like, what is happening? And something happened, and like the 40th time I heard it, I'm like, no, this is genius. <laughs> this is raw pain and singing. And, 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 but I didn't, I couldn't, I needed a ton of listens to get to there. Because you were trying to, you were listening in the wrong kind of way. Yeah. You were listening musically. You weren't listening with the heart. That's a heart record. All right, here he is. So where, take me back to your childhood and where the bug of music began. Um... My bug of music actually started early. I guess I, um, around fifth, sixth grade, um, just music in the house, you know. Uh, what was it? The Temptations, James Brown, hearing that on the radio. Um, my father playing uh, um, albums of, he had like Nat King Cole, he had um, uh, Oscar Peterson, um, jazz, he played yeah. all the time. Um, and my brother was in music. My brother Melvin, uh-huh. he was a, um, the first introduction to music because he was like he had a band that uh, he put together called the Soul Innovations, uh-huh. and it was uh, and they were good, and it was like my first time seeing like you know live music on stage, and so we used to, and they they performed at some of the local TV shows, and it was exciting, you know, to actually see that. And, he was like, like Melvin. He was. He could sing. He could dance. He was. He was James Brown, and he was the Temptations. He was all of it in one. He had to be everything that day. And, and so I grew up in a town where music was everywhere. What town? Uh, Indianapolis. How much older was Melvin? Melvin was uh, probably about four years older. Okay, four or five years older. Yeah. So, so. Old enough that you're looking up to him, but but not so old that you can't you can go with him when he goes to do a show. Well, like I was in sixth grade, he was um, he he was in high school, um, so he was. Um, I remember there was a a thing called at a mixer that he was playing in a high school that he actually asked me to come sing. Well, he asked my brother Kevin and myself if we wanted to sing. And then we had to audition for the part. <laughs> <laughs> but he already knew how well you could sing. No, 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 he didn't. I was, it was brand new. And he didn't know. It was between, you know, Kevin and myself. And Kevin has always had that voice, always had that high voice. And I don't know how I beat Kevin out at that time. I don't. Kevin says it was political. So <laughs> <laughs> it probably was um, because there's no way that, you know, I could sing as good as him. And But I got the part and I got to go to the mixer and sing. Uh, who's loving you, um, Jackson Five? Who's loving you? Right. And uh, it's so funny because, like, to this day, the song that they played as I walked up to the stage uh, was "I Want You Back." Uh-huh. And for the longest time, when I would hear "I Want You Back," I'd get nervous all over again. I could feel the, I could, I could just feel the tension in the air, like, oh my god, I gotta go up. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's you know. Like one of those things that just kind of a, a trigger what? that would make me nervous. That's amazing. So when did you start to say, oh, I'm kind of good at singing. I'm kind of good at writing. That's funny. Um, that probably t- came years later. Uh-huh. Um, I started writing because I kind of had a crush on a girl, and so I wanted to write a song for her. And, um, Who was the girl? Around a new boat. Did you get her? No. <laughs> but the song was good. The song was not great. Um, but it was the first song, uh, the first song I wrote, and the uh, Here I Go Falling in Love again. And uh, then the second song I wrote was about her, too. And it was a couple years later. 
uh, got the bitter taste of life. So, you know, a um, little happy and sad all at the same time. Uh -huh. And I, otherwise, I was just kind of picking up the guitar and just trying to learn how to play chords. Uh -huh. And so the chords that I learned how to play, that's what I wrote a song to. So was it a musical home? Because you didn't, because a lot of people might say, I was in the church, but yeah. you're not saying that. I, I, I Were went, you in the bands I, in? I went to church with my mom from sixth grade to probably ninth grade. Um, so I was going to church, but I wasn't in the choir. I loved listening to the music. We didn't really play music around the house in terms of together with each other. Every It was pretty separate. But we watched, but I would watch my brother, Melvin, and then we I started joining all kind of little bands, all from sixth grade, from sixth grade on. Joining bands. Yeah, like little groups. I had a group in sixth grade, you know. It was just, just a singing group that me and my buddies did in, in sixth grade. Then from probably eighth grade on, into seventh grade, eighth grade on, I was in little bands. That from the <clears throat> Gemini 8, LC Soul Unlimited, uh, the Elements, uh -huh. these are all different groups. The Indy 5, uh -huh. all different groups that I was part of. and um, They sound like 60s groups. Yeah. The Indy 5, the Elements. Well, yeah. I mean, the Indy 5 was definitely a copy of the Jackson 5. Right. Um, but but we played instruments, you know, and we every, there was a bass player, there's a drummer, there, you know. Guitar. I played guitar. And uh, it was it was what everybody did in the neighborhoods. There were so many bands. So you didn't play sports. You did music. I I didn't play sports. Uh, my my brothers were in sports. We had a wrestling family. So, okay. Uh, my oldest brother Marvin, he was a regional champion. And it's, so, it's tough in the Midwest. Yeah, they ain't so, playing in Indiana. They ain't playing. And then no, the wrestling was a was a big thing, and and so and everybody. All my brothers before me were on the wrestling team. Oh wow! And so, and everybody did good. I actually was okay with it. You wrestled. Um, I wrestled in high school. In in junior high school. What was your weight? Ninety eight. Were you good? I was good, but I quit. H how long did you do it? Uh, I quit right when it started. <laughs> right when we were doing the, uh, um, you know, in in gym class, I wrestled the guy that won the class in 98 mm -hmm. and uh and i actually beat him in class but oh but, wow. and because this so so my teacher really wanted to wanted me to come in wrestling but i wanted to do music and i didn't want to and i hated the way the locker room smelled so <laughs> um, it's i didn't feel i didn't like that burning feeling that you get you know, yeah working out so i ended up just going towards music instead of going down the same road that all my brothers did, did it was was it what was it about music that you were like, that's for me? It was my voice. I was a very shy kid. And so without the music, I don't I don't think I would have had a voice at all. It it was my connection to everyone that I almost everyone that I met. Um it was my my connection to girls, which not girls that I ended up dating, but just girls sure being, being friends. Yeah. And um Having a voice without it, I, I don't know that I would have ever really said much to anyone. I feel like that sense continued into your career in that you were a superstar who seemed like he was shy. So, like, I'm going to talk, I'm going to sing on the mic, and then I'm quiet. Yeah. Right? And and, and off my off mic, I'm, I'm, I'm chilling. I'm in the corner. Pretty much. I'm not like, ah! <laughs> right, yeah. Like Prince was, rah, yeah. you know, you were like. It's interesting. Prince wasn't actually rah rah either. He was, I, I know, I, I, I yeah, know, yeah. I know. R wrong guy. <laughs> I know. Well, some, he, he, had his, he, he had his way. He had of, his moments of doing his thing. Yeah, but in 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 his world that he controlled. Yeah, but other than that, he chose to, you know, kind of just be quiet. But you, but you, the the shyness pervaded Babyface. Yeah, the 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 whole the whole phenomenon. Yeah, it it was it it, it ended up becoming just part of a, a, a natural thing. And the babyface thing, you know, that was by luck that you know Bootsy Collins just yeah. happened to call me that. You know? But I mean, like you you were a phenomenon. I mean, like you were a massive 
singer, songwriter. I mean, what you are making faces. What are you? What, what, are, what are you talking about? <laughs> I phenomenon. I don't know, but this is what I mean. You one of the greatest pens ever. Great voice, historic producer. I mean, like we. I I don't know. I just don't. I've been blessed to have, you know written a few songs, good songs. I, I look. I've I've written and been in the rooms with everybody. Yeah, I mean Stevie Wonder, Paul McCartney, um, you know, to Phil Collins, to Eric Clapton, to a Madonna, to Whitney Houston, to a Barbara Streisand. So I've been around such greatness that it's easy for me to like look at myself and say, oh, okay. Because I've been around people that, you know, that I, I look up to so much and like, wow. So we being in a room and working with, you know, this encyclopedia of greatness of the last three decades, who are the talents that you're like, okay, those people are on a whole other level, not just from you, but from everybody. Yeah. Um, I didn't work with them, but Prince was on that level. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Um, Stevie was on yeah. that level. Yeah. Um, uh, Paul McCartney. In their own way, um, Aretha Franklin. Of course. On that level. Just just, um, just the greatness that no one else was going to come back and ever do it again. Yeah. You know? Um, Barbara Streisand. Um, there are, there's just something about, um, especially if we're, whether we're talking about the artist or whether we're talking about writers, like for Stevie and for Smokey and for, uh, Paul McCartney, how did they write so many songs? How did they come up with the, all these ideas? What what happened? I talked to to all of them, and and I, I would ask Stevie and Paul in particular. I said, "What was their magic dust in the air? You know, what made what was happening during those years that made you guys write what you wrote, and how did you how were you able to keep coming with it? Because I I can only say it was magic dust. It was there something in the air? That that was filling, that that gave you these ideas. And, what did they say? Um, they didn't really have an answer. The only thing Paul said at one point, I said, because I said, how did you come up with the wal walrus? <laughs> he said <laughs> drugs. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that yeah. that probably brought that one. But yeah, all the rest of it, I don't think drugs had anything to do with uh, let it be. But um, but there was um something amazing about the time that they that they grew up in the world that they were in that allowed this creativity to to live and breathe and and it was untainted and it was fresh and so what they had to gather from i just feel like it was there was an innocence about it and it and it allowed that creativity to flourish in ways that is much harder to do today because the world is a, it's a far different world we talk about you and Prince and Madonna and Bootsy. The Midwest yeah. is incredible. What is it about the Midwest that has produced so many icons? Something, something about growing up in, in small towns to where um, there's, a, there's a hunger um, that you, you want to... You want to make it out of your town. Um, you want to do great things, and you don't even know what those great things are, but you know it's greater than where you are and when you are. And so there's a, there's this this push that you have in you that just makes you just keep going. Um, I always called Detroit like the Renaissance area, yeah. er, era. Yeah. Because it's, you know, how... In the Renaissance, you had so many great artists that came from, you know, Italy and the, and from Florence and this, this whole area. How 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 did so many great artists come from one area? Well, the same thing applies to Detroit and to Motown. And what what happened in that ten mile radius with Smokey and, and Diana Ross and, and all these people that were became incredible towns? They all lived close to each other. How how does that happen? And 
in a sense, that's kind of like what happened in the whole Midwest area. Mm -hmm. There were so many great artists um, that just came from that area. And I think that it's, what I just mentioned is it's, there was a hunger that was there that we didn't even know we had. When I, th I think of you as kind of the epitome of R and B for this, for that era, for your era, mm -hmm. right. You know, and, and what is R and B to you? It's an interesting question because, um, R and B is ever waving at this particular point in terms of what, what it is and who, what it influences. Um, R and B is everywhere. Um, R and B is um, it's the music that I, that not only myself did, but the Teddy Rileys and and the Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. We all got it from R and B. Uh, and even though it's changed over the years, and then uh, and it became the, the New Jack Swing and everything else, but it was also R and B was also part of what you know. Uh, what Little Richard did, what obviously what James Brown did, and yeah. and obviously it, it it also even went over to artists um, like a Justin Bieber, absolutely, and um, uh, to to artists that weren't black but sure. were doing R and B music, sure that they call it pop music, but it's still R and B influenced. So R and B has. The legs of R&B goes very far, yeah. And so I, it's hard to put it in a, put it in a space for me, because I remember something being said to me a long time ago by Dick Griffey. <laughs> that's uh, how we so met. Cause, yes, because I was doing a story on Dick, mm -hmm. and that's that. I, right. and that's when we first talked. Well, Dick, great, great record man from yes. the '70s who is critical to the beginning of your career. Yes, yes. So Dick mentioned Dick was. It used to be part of their RIAA, and he used to go in there and have these battles with them because they would make the decision in terms of how much money you might put towards R and B or you put towards pop. But the big argument would be was about Michael Jackson because Michael Jackson clearly made R and B music, right? But they started labeling it pop music, right? And he was so pissed about that because he said, "Because the fact is, when they label it pop, then they just take away the importance of R and B." And it's really R and B music, but now that you're calling it pop music, now you're just saying it's it's not it's not black music anymore. Yeah. And um and he was just trying to make the point that now now suddenly Michael Jackson, who did this clearly R off the wall that was clearly an R and B record, yeah. but because it sold so many records, that made it pop. So is is pop music just because it sells a lot of music, or is it the sound of it? What it's you know it was unclear, and so, and I think that that same thing still applies. You know, to this day, you know, from uh, the Ariana Grande days to every, it's all music that is based from R and B. Yeah. So and so, just to call it pop music is not it's not it's not quite fair because R and B is a big part of it. Yeah, it's not right. Tell me, talk to me about what you think about as a songwriter as you're writing a song. Uh, that depends um, on who I'm writing for, uh, try, what kind of song we're trying to write. Um, if it's sitting with the guitar, if it's something emotional, if it's a sad song, if it's a happy song, a love song, it, it varies in so many ways. So it's not like, I go to the same place every time, um, especially when you're writing for other artists as well. Um, it, it, it's changed over the years, I think. You got to get. Are you saying you got to get in the mood of the song you're trying to do first? Kind of. It depends. Um, yeah, more or less. Because if it's if it's something fast, if it's something that's um, very heartfelt, I used to. The best way to get to like a, a sad song or pretty songs, whatever like that, I, I would go all the way back to the very beginning, to that song that I was writing for the Ronda New Boat, and, you know, the way that I felt as a kid, how in love I was. And that puppy love is the strongest kind of love, period, because the emotions are just, you know, it's just off the, off the charts. Yeah. So 
I would always go back to that space and try to remember that feeling and, and then try to write from that, that perspective. So you're a little bit like an actor in trying to find a genuine emotion. Yeah. And then apply that to a fictional piece of work. Yes. It's a good, good analogy. Um, can we talk about a couple of the records that you've made and just some of your thoughts on what you were trying to do? Because you sure. had some, incre- I mean, Breathe Again, Tony Braxton is one of the great records of that era. What were, you, what were you trying to do? So that? Breathe Again, funny enough, as I was playing the chords and I was actually writing it initially for an artist that we were working with called MacArthur and Melvin Gentry. He was part of uh, Midnight Star. We had signed him at LaFace. And so initially when I started writing the chords and writing the song, I was writing for him. No words or anything. It was just those chords. And going. And then as I started playing those chords, then the melodies started coming to my head and, and the lyrics. And then immediately I said, okay, no, this can't be for MacArthur because this is something special. And then I went back with that song. I went back to the Rhonda days, you know, and I started, Remembering that feeling, if I never see you, if I, mean, if I never feel you in my arms again, you know, if I never feel your tender kiss again, I start thinking those things, that, that desperation of that kid. And that's kind of like how that song was so desperate because I, I went back to that, you know, that seventh, eighth grader that was so in love, and that's how desperate it was. And so I, I, took, I traveled at that particular point, too. And that's kind of like where that song, how it, how it came to life. And then it only made sense because Tony Braxton had that kind of voice that, that, you know, that just kind of like sung to that desperation that, you know, that, that need and that want. And so it, it made sense. And, um, and so she really was singing the words of a, a <laughs> an eight, eighth grader. Do you write with pen and paper or do you sit at a piano? Uh, back then it was probably, um, it was a piano and a probably a uh, paper writing on paper. Now you what, use a recorder. Um, I'll use a recorder sometimes to put the melody down, but then I'll uh, and I'll just do the uh, write the words on the computer. So when you do a song like "Breathe Again," you 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 make the music. Do you sing a reference vocal that Tony will then to yes. tell her how you want her to sing it? Yes, it uh, basically kind of do a quick little demo of it and then, but she's going to sing it the way she's going to sing it either way. Um, cause she's, they kind of have their voice that they have. It's like writing a song for voice to men. You can put a basic idea, but you know that they're going to come in with their individual voices and, that, and that's what, that's where it takes it to the next level. Yeah. Let's talk about end of the road. Cause that, Boys to Men, that is a gigantic record that plays all the time yeah. to this day. And you kind of captured a very melancholy feeling, mm-hmm. right? That like like that emotional note is not, you don't normally hear that in a song, but you really nail and like you kind of feel sad. Yeah. You know, like what were you going for there? Was that for them? That was for them. It was uh for this uh, movie Boomerang. Right. And um Got the call that we, that Boys and Men was going to be part of it. Initially, when I was writing the record, wasn't sure they were going to be able to do it. And so after I finished writing the song, because I definitely was writing with them in mind, and finished writing it, I thought, wow, this is a good one. Maybe I should keep this for myself. <laughs> um, um, but I didn't sing it nowhere as good as they did. Um, but it was, after finishing it, I felt like the, I felt like it was a special one. Um, I never could say whether someone was a hit or not. I just felt like something felt good or not, and, and whether it was special. If you really feel it, that's what you're looking for. Yes. You you don't know if it's going to be a yeah, hit. I never know the hits, but if I really feel it, then it's something worth exploring, trying to get that feeling down. Mm-hmm. And uh, so with Boys to Men, when they came in, we went to uh, Philadelphia to record them. Um, it was like, it was amazing how it fit their voices, you know, and how the song just came alive with their voices. The song was the song was good, 
to begin with. But it, it when you're a writer and 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 even a singer and and you kind of record things and you put your demos down, sometimes the songs are really good. And, um, but the the real exciting part is when you hand it over to the next to the artist that you the intended artist and they take it to the next level. I think there's something special about those four guys on that material. Yes. It, a one singer probably couldn't bring it home the same way when you have a group. No, no, you need you need the backup, you know, the one to take it home. You know, why use the take it home guy? <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know the um, the talking part that was like like he was singing. Uh, Michael was singing in the background, but you know everybody wanted to wanted to have a part. So that's how the whole talking part came. It's like okay, we gotta give him a part. So yeah, let's go with the you know baby. I wish you. <laughs> but we love a good talking part. Yeah, we didn't love it then. <laughs> You know, that was like something that had gone away forever. And the fact that it worked, it was hilarious. Um, and it was, it, it became a big thing because of it. When I was in college, it was all about Bobby Brown. Oh. It was, we didn't talk about, for like nine months, we didn't talk about anything. Nobody else existed. <laughs> right. He was the biggest fuck thing there yeah. was. Yeah. Don't be cruel was the first song right off that yeah, album and yes. it was like this monster like oh i feel like the 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 music is dope right the song the uh, to me the song is fine right but it's his performance that makes it special yes right yes yes um it's like there are songs that Bobby's a great singer. He's a great performer. He's not the best singer. We've worked, I've worked with singers that are way better than Bobby. In New Edition. In New Edition. But the thing that got me interested in Bobby in the first place, um, we just come from a meeting at MCA. They talked about doing something with the boys. Uh, talked about doing something with uh, Pebbles. And um, Mercedes boy, Mercedes boy, Pebbles, <laughs> and uh, and there was uh, possibly Johnny Gill at the time, but not yet. But I think they all this stuff was kind of happening at the same time. But then and then Bobby was mentioned. You know, Bobby's uh, Bobby Brown. He's got a record out right now. Because but, but he he had left New Edition. He left New Edition, so he had a he had a solo record, out. which was a little like, what's he doing? Because you're not the best singer in New Edition. That's Ralph. Right, we usually see the best. Yeah, but they they liked Bobby, so we love Bobby. Yeah, so but we usually see the best singer in the group peel off. Yeah, well, you know, we know why he left at that point. You know, but right, but he tried this. He he, he had this song called "Girlfriend," and uh, it was an okay song. It, was, it wasn't doing that great, but I remember riding in the car, listening to KJLH and he was doing a live thing on KJLH and he started to sing that song. And as he was singing, he went for a note that he couldn't get mm. and he got mad. He said, I didn't want to sing that song anyway. <laughs> and I said, Whoa. <laughs> and I caught that energy. I said, wow. Yeah. I'd like to work with him. Really? Cause the, cause he was just, I could feel that crazy energy. And so when it came to work with him, I said, okay, this could maybe work. And so Don't Be Cruel hadn't been written yet. Um, and I, when I thought of Bobby, um, you know, L.A. had actually come up with the beat. L.A. Reed. And so I took that beat and did the rest of the music on top of it. And then I wrote um, Don't Be Cruel, thinking of Elvis Presley. I said, this guy's like, he should be like Elvis Presley. He's like, you know. So I wanted to get as close to that that whole idea. It sounded nothing like Elvis Presley. It's not right. Crew, but it was the whole I idea. Of but it. that phrase was famous yeah, from yes. Elvis. So yeah. Um, and when Bobby came to sing, sing the song, he he didn't really like it. Really? He didn't he didn't like a few of the things that he did. So he did Don't Be Cruel and then 
we did Rock With You and did Roni and um and Every Little Step and those are all songs that he was he was most excited about my prerogative. Hmm. Which understandable because you know Teddy had just come off of doing uh I Wanna with Keith Sweat. So Teddy was hot. Yeah. And Teddy was like he was all the way into the new Jack Swing thing and that was that was the thing. Yeah. And uh so I, I got it. And in all honesty, the music that we were doing at the time with Bobby, it was I thought it was I thought it was great. He didn't. But he didn't think it was great. Wow. Um and he but then he obviously it it it, it changed. It's what, amazing that he was able to perform the records that well, even while he didn't fully believe in well, them. He, yeah, he didn't fully believe in He did the best that he could do, but everybody else made him believe in it. Because once it started to work for him, he said, okay, let me go. Because he was always a performer first. And like a lot of these songs were written way before they ever got to him. So like Don't Be Cruel was written for him. Every Little Step was not written for him. Who was Every Little Step? That was originally wrote that for um, Midnight Star. Okay. They turned it down. Wait, the bass line on Don't Be Cruel is... it Right? And there's times when the record kind of lays out and it's just him and the bass line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of ominous. And like it's creating that feel yeah, yeah. of like it's dark and it's night and he's right. trying to talk to this girl. Yeah. It's very Bobby. <laughs> but it's very cinematic. Yeah. It's... <laughs> the whole choir thing. I remember I I did that choir part, um, uh-huh. and it was um, but but yeah, it was supposed to, it was it was just supposed to be huge, and I think that um, that song you know it obviously opened up the door. The other songs, funny enough, like every little step and rock with you and Roni, those songs were written uh, well before they ever got to Bobby. Interesting, and so. Um, Every Little Step was interesting because Don't Be Cruel was a monster. It was a deeper sound, right? And my prerogative had a, was also a monster. It had a deeper sound. And Every Little Step was a brighter sound. Yeah. So it was like broadening the appeal of, of Bobby of like, I can hit you on different emotional notes. It was, it was, it was uh, uh, happier. Yeah. Happy song. Yeah. Um, and it was, um, you know, it, it was about... Just, just being lighter, and then um, even with even with Roni and uh, and Rock with you because those were like, you know, Roni was written actually back in probably eighty three. Okay, you know, way before. So, and so you just have that just sitting and like si- sitting. Is it for you? No, it's not for you. Is it for you? No. I, didn't, I didn't even try to give it to anyone else. It was something that I wrote um, way back in. I think at 83 on the tour with uh, Luther and DeBarge. This whole story that comes with that. But, um, What's the story? <laughs> it, it's basically, um, I think I've told it before, but Roni, the whole idea, Every back in 83, that's when everybody even started talking about saying saying the word Roni. Okay. The fact that it lasted that long, <laughs> you know, it was interesting. Um, but... We were on tour with Luther and DeBarge, and we were down in Miami, and for some reason, they we didn't get to play on that show, The Deal. I was in the group, The Deal. Right, right. And uh, we didn't get to play on that show. We played the night before. We were supposed to play at a skating rink, and uh, it got canceled because you know, <laughs> Luther and DeBarge was coming to town. And so we were hanging there, and we had nothing to do, and they said, let's take our bus down to the concert anyway so we went and parked outside of the arena this was where we could meet girls we sat there we put our lead singer d in in the front of the bus and had the door open and he was to attract the girls because he was the good looking guy and uh so everybody came uh people would come by the bus and say is that the bars no it's not the bars it's the deal we were supposed to be on the show but you know we got here late so um (laughs) then D, uh, say we're having a little after party at at our hotel. You guys want to come by, and so he invited a number of people at the hotel. And um, 
was a young girl that uh, got on the bus at the same time and came and he invited her there. And um, I remember going to the hotel. This story is so long, though. I just really want to tell it. <laughs> I remember going to the hotel. When we go, went to the hotel, I didn't get to go to my room because Daryl Simmons, you know, who I, uh, one of my best friends, we grew up together. Yeah. He was on tour with us. And he had the room for some reason. He said, I'm going to need the room for a little bit. You can't come up there for a little bit. All right. So I sat down in the lobby just waiting for Daryl to come back from the room. <laughs> and uh, he took his time. While I was sitting there, um, this young girl walks in. And she's supposed to meet D, but D had already had somebody else up there. So. And I wasn't sending anybody anywhere. So she came down and started talking to me. And we talked about the weather, just talked about everything. And then all of a sudden, D came down and he says, hey, I didn't see you. I, I thought I didn't see you here. I didn't know you was coming. He said, come on up. So in my conversation, he grabs her and she goes up with him to the room. <laughs> Once again, I'm sitting there by myself waiting for Daryl to come. And then probably about 10 minutes later, she comes back down. And she says, oh, my God, it's just too much. It was like, you know, it was just too much. I'm just going to say that. And so I said, well, you know, shouldn't have just walked to his room. You don't you don't just do that, you know. She goes, I know, but, you know, I just I said, you know, it's not, that's not something you should always do. So then um, we're sitting there. I'm still waiting for Daryl. Daryl finally comes down. I said, I said, it's nice to meet you, but I'm going to go up to my room now. And she goes, you can't leave me here by myself. I said, yeah, but I, I just, I'm just going to go up. She says, promise, I'll just go up with you. I'll just sit. And, and I said, okay, fine. So we went up to the room. I think her friend was seeing Carlos. And so her friend finally knocked on the door and said that she was leaving and saw Carlos. And so she started to walk out. I said, I told her I would walk her downstairs. I started walking her downstairs, and then D came out of his room, and he saw me with her. And he goes, oh, no, this ain't going to hold. Because he goes like, this is, I, he just got Jacoby. Now, Jacoby was a word we used to use because uh, we used to what? Jacoby and Myers. No, okay, you you start to scare me that you knew what it was. No. <laughs> so, ah, the law uh, firm. Was, no, what you talking about? No, Jacoby was a character on All My Children. Oh, yeah, I didn't watch the stories. Okay, so then. You watch the stories? Yeah, we, we, on the, in the group, that's all we did. You know, we you play, and then you, daytime you watch you know, all my children. And Steve Jacoby was a character on there that stole, stole women. <laughs> <laughs> he stole, he stole Cliff's, he stole Nina from Cliff and that was big time. And so we had this whole thing of like, you know, you know, you got to watch out cause you get Jacoby out here. <laughs> you pick a girl. And, and so it was happening rampant. It was like, no matter if you start talking to somebody, next thing you know, somebody knows Jacoby. <laughs> And it was just getting bad. And so, um, so Diego, he thought you had done Diego's, that. Diego's, oh no, I just, this one I hold. He said, We're having a meeting tomorrow. So we had a group meeting the next day. And uh, D started off saying, Look, this Jacoby, this Jacoby shit has gone too far. We got to stop this. And then I said, I didn't Jacoby you. Uh, and he goes, No, 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 you Jacoby. I had this girl. And she was, I said, No, no, no. First of all, I didn't Jacoby you. You was with the Roni. And the truth about Aroni, they're sweet girls, and you have to treat them right. And I stopped and thought, Boom. "That's a song. That's a song." <laughs> and no lie, after that meeting, um, there was a rule that you know we get stopped on this Jacoby stuff. No but, Jacoby. <laughs> but after that meeting, I went to my room and got on my Prophet T eight because we used to bring the equipment to the room, and I started writing um, Roni. With the chords, and I wrote that song actually way back then, in about '83 or so. And that song waited till about 80, '88, '89 when we recorded it. Do you have a bunch of old songs? There's a whole bunch of things that I have still on that that has never been recorded that you might pull out. Uh, I haven't pulled them out, but there's a bunch of songs that, that I didn't think made it up to the, the thing, you know, worth recording, but. Maybe. Yeah, I had a lot of songs. Maybe. You had a lot of songs? Yeah. I mean, I, that's all I all I would do. Well, when we were in the deal and people were going out to parties, I'd go to my apartment and go in my closet and be writing songs. That's why 
there were so many songs to do over those years when I was, because I kind of had them already written. Is part of why we think you're a great songwriter because you've written a lot of songs and put some away and, you know, right? Like if I wrote 10 songs, I might get one good one. You wrote 100 songs, you got 10 good ones or 20 yeah. good ones. It, it, there were just so many songs that were uh, a piece of starts, uh, even just starts of songs and things that um, that I wouldn't go all the way on, but that idea was there. And so um, a lot of things, especially in the early years, they were kind of there. Um, my, my, my wasn't written for Johnny Gill. It was actually written for, um, with the whispers in mind. Oh, well. And uh, I think it was a budget issue that they didn't. When you're, but when you're writing for a person, you think about where they are in their career, where they're trying to go. They need to hit a certain audience or they need to evoke a certain emotion, right? Your, your vibe is this, but you need to continue it or yeah. change it or. Yeah. You do that to, you, you do that as you become more successful and, and you can, um, get those people in the room. When you can't get people in the room in the beginning years, you just kind of write in general. So, and you just write a girl song or you write a guy song. So like girlfriend that ended up going on pebbles, it wasn't written for Pebbles. It was just a song that I wrote that a girl could do. And initially it was, we were going to do it on Vanessa Williams. And um, we had a three song deal with the Vanessa Williams that we were supposed to do. It. Then we met Pebbles. And when I saw, heard Mercedes Boy, and I saw Pebbles and who she was, I kind of uh, said, I had said to LA at that particular point, I said, that's girlfriend. I need to take that song and put it on. So you, there's a visionary ness to you in terms of this record fits that person. Right? I, I, Not that record. Yeah. This record. I always said that the song comes first. Right. Meaning that the song goes to the right home. Oh, oh, right, right, right. right. We got to send the song to the right person. Yes. The song, the priority of the song comes first. And the, the person that makes that song come alive is the person that should have that song. You know, it shouldn't do it because of a friend reason, but the person that can make it, give it the right feeling. So you're saying not the biggest, the right, because you'll get pressure from, let's yeah. say, Rihanna needs a record. Like, that's great, but yeah. this, is, this record is not for Rihanna. If it's not for Rihanna, if she can't make it come alive, then what's the point? You know, it's like you go with who can make, does it mean sometimes you're asking for your records back because somebody starts singing it and you're like, I never, well, I guess that was, that was one time where it, we didn't actually record it, but had we recorded it, it probably would have been too late to grab it from Vanessa. But, um, so I try to make that decision before it would ever happen. One of the things that, I never forgot. Remember when Bobby and Whitney had their reality show? I think it was on, it wasn't, it wasn't on A&E. Maybe it was a and &E. I don't remember. You remember the show. And I remember once they were in Miami or something, and Whitney was sitting at a table by herself, and Bobby was like six feet away, like surrounded by fans. And he said, some people get into the business to show off their talent, and that's Whitney. And some people get in the business because they want to interact with people. And that's Bobby. And I've always felt like that seems like a pretty good uh, sort of dichotomy for the sort of people you encounter in the music industry. Mm -hmm. And as far as artists. Yeah, maybe so. I think in the case of Bobby, Bobby loved the attention, but Bobby also loved the music too. It was just as, and he loved to perform. Um, and he, as you say, at the time, he was, he, no one could be, was any bigger than Bobby Brown. And he was, he was electric on stage. And so what, what he was able to do, there was no other artist that could do what Bobby could do. Because he, because no. he had that thing. It. He had, yeah, he had it, it so many times over. Who did you want to work with who you didn't, just didn't get a chance to work with? 
I wish I could have uh, worked with um, Marvin Gaye. I wish I could have gone in the studio with him. I did a song with Luther, but I wasn't ever been in the studio with him when he did it. So I wish, really wish I could have really worked with him. I actually wrote every time I closed my eyes for Luther, mm. and he turned that down. Mm. And uh, I'm glad he turned it down, but um, I also would have been glad if he had done it. Yeah. Um, but so Luther is, was one of those artists. Um, Sade is an artist I always wanted to work with. You know, um, you and Sade would be an amazing fit, right? Because you're in a very similar lane. I love the pain in her voice. And the pain excites me for writing sake, you know. And when I hear that, the pain, the emotion in her voice, that's what, yeah. Well, if you start from there, what would you write for her? Like, what would be the song? What would be the vibe? That I, I, I can't really tell you because it would, there'd have to be conversation uh, with her and to know who she is and where she is at this point in her life and what, what new things, are, if anything, needs to be said. It was like having the chance to work with Prince. I wouldn't have known what to do. Yeah. Well, you know, there, there was no place for another person. Yeah. So it's like, why even, yeah. Why even try? Yeah. Um, but with Sade, I felt like, you know, um, and maybe not, but I always felt like there was something that, you know, I could figure, I'd figure it out. You know, I didn't know that even working with Madonna, that it made sense for the, the for the two of us, you know? Um, sure. And, but, I mean, she's a great writer and, and a great artist. And so we got in there, and we figured it out, you know, so um, it, it's, you never know exactly till you put people together and have that conversation. But I think you saying Marvin Gaye first yeah. shows perhaps the esteem that you hold him in. No question. Um, he was a true artist who always wore his emotions on his sleeve um, and, and not afraid of it in any sense. Um, and that was that was exactly what I mean. I would have loved to have just experienced that, to gone through that with him. You know? I mean, he had so much, so many modes. Yeah, you know what's happening on what's going on is not what's happening on here, my dear. And even here, my dear, blows me away. Like he's trying to make a bad record and he can't. Right. <laughs> Like, exactly. I can't be bad. <laughs> ah! Um. So Marvin Gaye's on your Mount Rushmore. Who else is up there? Stevie, of course. Yeah. Um. I I think the Beatles. Okay. No question. Have uh, heavily influenced me. Um, as a writer and, and just being amazed at what, what they were able to do is in a, in a short amount of time, the, the songwriting that they did. Um, it's so hard to have, a, a, cause my, my Rushmore would be full of so many different people cause at, there are different points in my life when I recognize the brilliance of people, you know, um, I don't, uh, working with Aretha Franklin, I don't know that I, um, I always appreciate Aretha Franklin, but as more time goes by, the more I appreciate her. Yeah. You know, like, you really know that, oh my God, you know, look at who you were in the studio with. Look at who you had a relationship with that you could talk to. And, you know, this was like one of the greatest of all time. And uh, there will never be another one. Yeah. So, um, yeah. and you know, we say we we say that word, that phrase lightly, you know. And but many times, as as time goes by, the more you realize that how true that phrase is. When you um, when you did "Baby, Baby, Baby" with TLC, yeah, 
it changed their career because it deepened them, right? Like we thought of them as deeper yeah. than, than, than we had originally realized. I don't know that I thought to that extent. I, I For them, I, I was just writing something that I thought would be cool and fun because they were fun. But they were they were wild, and that record was like was yeah it, 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 yeah it R and beat them a little bit yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, before because you know hat to the back you know that could have been just um, that that could have just been something that they could have been a fly by night with that but but they were far deeper than that and Lisa was far deeper than that so yeah. um, the ingredients for them. They they were the ingredients, you know, and if you when you thought of writing for them, then you thought of writing for, um, for that for Tion's voice, who was so unique. Do you love hip hop? I love all music. Is uh, do you is hip hop different to you? Like I live in I'm in R and B. That's a little bit of a different language. I love it. I I, I if it feels good, I'm with it. But you don't make it. It's, it's not what I, it's not what I do. Yeah. Um, if I grew up in it, then I'd make it. Yeah. Yeah. But since I didn't grow up in it, and it's not, it's, it's not in my blood, so to say. I can appreciate it. I can do pieces of it. I can work with it. I can work within it. I don't. I can't create it the same way. No. No. No different than how I'm not necessarily new jack swing. Yeah. You know. Um, I kind of. I'm a producer, and so I can. I can do a little bit of it all, and especially if I have the right people in the room, no question, I can listen and learn. And, um, but is it in my blood? No. But yeah. Do I love it? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you said New Jack because New Jack, I think, is the son of hip hop and R and B. Yes. And so if you're like that, like I live on this, I this, I this language is in my blood of R and B. Yeah. Right, like I mean, like yeah, I can see what you're saying. Like that's not, it's not what I grew up with. Right, wasn't, and but it's what was around me as uh, as I was working through the years. It was around, me. so um, you know, you you have to adapt, or you you don't stay in the game. What made L.A. Reed the perfect partner for you that you guys did so much great stuff together I think that um, the in the beginning the working together like LA was a, a, a good producer he's put he put his time in on the producing and um he wasn't so much, he wasn't necessarily the writer. Uh, he was a producer. And so when I would come up with things and when I do things, then he would put that time in to helping with John Gass, helping to create that sound and um, to find the sound. Um, that is a funny thing because the sound is like, could be the road sound or something that I would do. And it could be, you know, because it, it, it ended up being coming art becoming this sophisticated R&B kind of thing, which was all about a Fender Road sound that I used to use. And so, but it was the drum programming. L.A. was basically a drum programmer. And so for the fast songs, it was really, it was very important. And that's kind of like what what opened the door. But what kind of got things going was it's because of the, all the songs that were being placed, that opened up the door to for the possibility of, having your own label because at that point it looked like you could you could go with artists that were barely known and have success with them and that's what record companies were doing so it opened up that door and then ultimately LA became an executive um, that you know was you know running the face as an executive that made helped make that happen because I pretty much stayed a writer and a producer, and I'd be involved to a certain extent, but I stayed true to being the kind of creative side. Creative side. What I, Did you not like the executive side? Um, you know, I can say that 
what I didn't like is what there were. I didn't like the games that would come with being on the executive side and, and that where artists could get hurt, where decisions could be made that weren't necessarily in the artist friendly. Um, and I wasn't involved in those decisions sometimes. And so we were put in positions sometimes where we were, you know, we, we were being sued by TLC. We were being sued by Tony Braxton because they didn't have fair deals in their minds. They didn't have fair deals. And, and they and they weren't fair deals. Ultimately, it was the deals that the deal that we were given, and we had to share. I mean, all artists have an unfair deal. Yes, but we we had the extra unfair, <laughs> <laughs> extra unfair deals. But and you say you're saying their deal was extra unfair because your deal, our deal, wasn't, wasn't necessarily a great deal to begin with. It wasn't a bad deal, but it wasn't a great deal. So we didn't have a lot to give. Wait, what was wrong with your deal? What was wrong with our deal? We only had so you only get there's only so much that you get when you're a joint JV. There's only so much it's already broken in half of what you get. You know, LaFace could only make fifty percent of a given album. Yes, and so by time, the artists would come for they'd get you know less than fifty of whatever we would have. Right, you know, their point. So they're so when they're selling all these records. They're not really getting the benefit of the sales that they that they did. I mean, yeah, there's a famous video all over the internet of Lisa Left Eye saying, "Here's how we made ten million dollars and had nothing." Yes, and she very quickly explains like ten million dollars times three women is nothing. Yeah, well, and they didn't really, you know, while they they sold so many albums, they they should have made much more. We went to uh, court. We went to court with. Uh, we didn't actually make it to court with TLC. I think they, that that deal got settled, but the deal with um, Tony Braxton went to court, and and I was put in an awkward position where the the judge asked me, I, I I have to be label, I have to be our artist. So he didn't say, I don't want to ask you as a label, head of a label. I want to ask you as an artist. Do you feel like the deal that Tony Braxton has is a fair deal? And I said, no. Oh, but it's different coming from face of the face <laughs> rather than just another artist on the label. So I said, no, it wasn't fair. And I think that if I sold the records that she sold, then no question, I think I should be getting much more. And she ended up getting a good, winning that deal. So I... I chose to be an artist and oppose an executive that day. Uh, um, an executive. Did people say to you, why did you say that? Why couldn't you I, have I, said, yes, it's a fair deal? I wasn't a popular guy uh, from the label side because of that. No, I wasn't. You know, but I didn't, but that wasn't, that wasn't why, why I did it, the label deal. You know, I did it because, you know, we were to find artists and help artists and we were going to try to be artist friendly and, and try to make sure that they could make as much. And, you know, the whole idea was to to help artists. Um, and I think that when you get into the business of making records and you get into the business of this whole record company business, the whole bit, you know, um, there's things that you're not going to be able to do because of the partners that you're in with. You're just not going to be able to make those decisions that you want. And so you you choose you choose one side. I I ended up choosing just to be on the creative side and not necessarily be a part of that world because people get hurt and people are taken advantage of and, and I'm not I'm not that dude. So wait, LaFace has an incredible creative history. Yes. But then you mentioned also you also have the TLC situation. You have the Tony Braxton situation. So do you look back on it as that was very successful or that was a very complicated period? It was complicated. It was it was a, a company to be proud of because of the success and the, how many artists came through. And um, it was a... Um, 
uh, a company to be very proud of in terms of the successes that we had in the artists that, that became su successful because of it. But there are also things about it that were complicated and I won't necessarily go into it, but, um, but wasn't always that great. And so, um, and that's what makes it complicated. Um, that makes what makes most of any of those businesses and record companies gets com it gets complicated because of the the deals that you make with the JVs that you make and, and the joint ventures, I should say. You know, so it, it's it's not uh, it's not a black and white situation. Yeah, you still like performing? I do. Why? I, um, it is the point where when you get on the stage and. Um, other than having to worry about whether you got a voice, uh, <laughs> the the joy of hearing people sing these words back that that you wrote, you know, that I wrote, and that, that they know every word and they're singing it and they're singing loud and and there's happy faces and it's, a, it's part of it. That's uh that's the best high that you can get is when as a songwriter is to hear people singing your music. So it doesn't matter whether it's a song that I that I sing or it's a song that I wrote for someone else. When they started, when they start singing those songs at the top of their lungs, you know, that's the best compliment that you can get. Is that better than applause? Yeah. <laughs> applause can, you know, people can always give you love at the end of it, but you want that too, because that shows that they, they appreciated singing it loud. So, you know, but when they're singing out loud, you know that it, it, it was a part of the fabric of their life. Yeah. You know, that tells you for sure that that was part of their life. So many of these records that you are a part of are really part of the fabric of people's lives. Records they played at graduation, wedding, you know, family moments, whatever. I mean, like, you're definitely part of so many people's lives with the music. I think that's, um, that's something that, you know, it's, it's a realization that comes with time, especially me being the kind of person that I am that I, I don't necessarily own it all the time. I, I, I don't think about it to the, to that extent, you know, uh, on a daily basis. Um, and so when I'm reminded uh, when I do perform or when people, I mean, here recently in the past couple of years, it's been like, you know, this, this, this whole goat thing. And um, mm -hmm. that's cool. <laughs> um, and it comes from everywhere. It comes from every, every age group. And stuff. Yeah. So it's, so, so that's, you know, that's been nice to at least, cause it shows amount of, a, a certain amount of respect for the work that you've done. Uh, and so I think that, um, that's what feels good about it because, you know, it means that my work wasn't in vain. So so. You, you, you work with all these incredible singers. I mean, it's like all the great singers eventually show up with you. Um, what's the difference between a good singer and a great singer? A great singer um, truly has their own sound. Um, they have their own emotion that they bring to it, to the table. Um, you don't have to tell them how to sing it. Um, you might make a suggestion here or there, but they already know who they are. And, um, and they, they know their voice well, so well that they, they can immediately get to the, to the emotional spots quickly. So a great singer doesn't necessarily mean that it's the biggest artist. You know, there are artists that may not be as big as others, um, but they they come in and they just go right to it. You know, one person I always mention, Brandy. She's one of the best singers I've ever worked with. She steps behind that mic, it's like, it's incredible. It's like, she's never wrong how she sings and how she just, it's just, it, it's just one of the best. And I know Whitney used to say it all the time about Brandy as well. She's like, oh my God, that, that little girl. 
So, um, and, and, you know, there are singers today that, um, that know, that know that what they do, that they know how to feel their way around it. Just, just in listening to them, you know, they know, they know themselves, they know their voices. Who else are some of the other singers that you are like, I work with him, her, among the best that you worked with? Today? Uh, all time. Um, obviously, Aretha Franklin still, and, um, and Whitney Houston. Um, um, Celine Dion. Yeah. Um, there's a. Uh, I don't think of people that might not be as obvious, but. Um, Sometimes it's just, it's a question of not it's not necessarily that they can do all the best riffs and everything or that that kind of person, but it's just it's just how sure they are in telling the story. One of the best, to be honest, is SZA. 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 The way she phrases uh, and 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 the melody, her melody choices, and the way she tells her stories, and the way that she tells it, the way that she writes it and tells it, it's it's so. Um, uh, it's so believable, and she's like, I'm, I'm always impressed by her and her voice, um, and her writing as well. I think that um, Jasmine Sullivan, yeah, you know, it's like she's. When I think of some of these artists, I think of like Jasmine Sullivan. I think like, you know, what Aretha would think of Jasmine. You know, she like Aretha wasn't. Um, she wasn't keen on giving anybody. <laughs> One day I asked Aretha Bring, I said, who's, uh, so who's out there? Who, who, who's, who do you like out there? And she said, what are you talking about? I'm like singers out there today, you know, all the top singers today. Who do you, who do you like out there? She, she stops where she goes, let me see. You mean besides myself? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, besides yourself. And then she started listing all these people. I had no idea who they were. It's sister so and so in uh the Mount Baptist choir. Uh, <laughs> yeah. She went she went there. But she she wasn't good she wasn't good for giving out, you know, brownie points unless they were they had to be really at the top of the game. I mean, some people have the technical ability and some people make you feel feel yes and they may not have the technical ability but you will feel it in your bones yeah no question look um it, it is i've been i've been in the room with all these things you know i'd be i'd be remiss to say that tony braxton has one of those voices she does those emotional voices yes she makes you feel it yes, yes. um and um and that's why, you know, uh, that's why we worked with her in the first place. Um, Anita Baker has that voice. Yeah. Um, and she also also has that pen. She the what? Wrote, the pen. She wrote those songs. Oh, the pen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and she wrote for herself. She knew her voice well enough to know how she needed to write those songs. And, and she has a sound that is unlike really anybody because she's deep for a woman right which and it's a it's a note or a register that a man probably wouldn't do and most women can't do so it's really really special it's very special and it's it's hers and hers alone and you would know her right away you know it right away and um and so like you know there there are Interesting thing, I keep saying all these uh, female voices, and it, we I, most of my career I've just spent with just great female artists. And yeah. I think that's why I just I tend to lean that way. Yeah, it just has has worked out that way. Um, and when I think of you know, because there's always Stevie, and and you know, you have great singers today. You know, um, uh, Bruno Mars, and you got you know. Um, 
got the weekend. Michael Jackson, you know, there's great guy singers, but I've always leaned towards female singers that really to, to go for the real emotion. Why? I don't know. For some reason, that that's where I've been able to. I think you can do anything, but love songs and ballads, you really excel. Yeah. That's and right. so if that's your that's your home home, then great women singers are going to be like, yeah, let me let me work in that space. Yeah, I think it's it it just has been that way. Not that it always has to be that way, but it's, it's been that way. Yeah. There's, you know, I work with groups, you know, um, from Boys to Men to After Seven to Drew Hill, and um, we did the thing with Milestone with, with Casey and JoJo. And, um, and so, you know, I've worked with guys, I've worked with guy singers, and, um, and they're there, but... But for some reason, once again, it's like to go back and let's talk about Mary J. Blige and you know the emotion that you know that she brings to the table, always would bring to the table. It's like um, it's it only makes sense that from whence I come, where I where I came from, and from my um, my upbringing and being. Um, that shy kid and, and and wanting to write about emotion from the get go, that I would lean towards writing songs for women. So this is something I'm just putting together or wondering about as you're talking about your your beginnings. As you're talking about your musical career, really starts to take off eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, more doing it more and more aptitude. And your father passes when you're in eighth grade. Yes. Is there a connection between losing him and you diving deeper into music? I don't know that there was. Um, that was a that was a big year. Um, a lot of things happened that year, just for me musically. My, my father passing away. Um, my father was in the hospital for almost a year and a half. Um, before he passed away. And in that hospital, in those days, um, as a kid, you were not allowed to go to the hospital. So I didn't see him for a year and a half. Mm. When he finally did pass away, it didn't seem real. Yeah. Um, and because he was already out of the house and he was already gone, I never, I only hear about him, but so I never saw him. Um, and it only came real to me at the funeral when they actually closed the casket. It's like, Cause it's like wow, he's, I'm never gonna see him again, and um, and I think it wasn't until then where it, where it affected me, and I, and I felt um, uh, I, I think I felt like we were suddenly alone, our family, my mom, and everything. We felt, and so we all kind of went our own ways at that point. We didn't necessarily come all together. We all kind of went our own ways and went into our own lives. And so I was in bands, I was in my music and, and everybody else kind of had their own separate life in my, in my, in that household. And I think, um, I think at that point, the whole music thing had already taken hold of me and it was something that it, was, it became like this mission that I was, I didn't even know that I was on. And, as I got better with it and as time went on, it, was, it seemed like there was no other choice, but that's what I was supposed to do. Um, and I didn't try anything else but that. I had one job, which I was a camp counselor <clears throat> uh, for a summer, part of a summer. And after that, uh, it was still music. And even then I was in a band. I just took a break and did the camp counselor thing. So um, other than that, it was just like, you know, you go for it and that's it. There's no, there's nothing else you can go for. Yeah. It's, it's music. And win or lose. That was it. There's no plan and, B. And there was no plan B. Um, and the, the plan B was to keep going for it. I mean, if you never quit, then eventually you'll succeed. 
Yeah. <laughs> Tell that to some of my, some of my friends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't always work out. I got, I was blessed. I, was, I got lucky. I was blessed that, that things turned out the way that they turned out. What do you want to do next with your career? I just want to uh, still keep doing what I've been doing. Play, uh, um, writing music, being part of music. Um, maybe get back into doing some more film and TV in terms of production and stuff. And, um, and just, just expanding, just seeing what's out there for me. Um, I feel, um, feel like there's still a lot that you know, I can do. And as long as people are opening the door, you know, then why not? Yeah. You know, there's always the chance of my blessing has been is that, that those doors are those doors are still opening. That I still have artists that are today artists that still want to get in the studio and still work with me. And I still have people that want to connect and and I could have been one of those, you know, producer writer artists that you know, where they could say, okay, you had your time, you had your moment. You have a timeless sound. It's not dated. So it's not, so it's like, he knows how to make hits. So like, let's call him because he can do that again. Because those records don't sound like, oh, that's so 83, yeah. that's so 97, yeah. whatever. Like, they're timeless. Well, the timeless thing is, if I can keep that on, then they can, they can keep me in the game. And, and, and really the trick to that is is to be open-minded and to never when something would come on if I didn't really like it but everybody else loved it then I was like okay I need to figure it out right right what 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 am I missing right cuz I'm missing something people are loving this and then, so I keep listening until I figure it out oh I mean, it's not about anything else, but that just feels good. Sometimes I wonder, if I listen to a record a hundred times, will I start to like it, like, regardless? Because mm. sometimes you like a record right away. Sometimes yeah. you, your ear has to acculturate to it. Yeah. But I'm like, is it just if I listen to it a lot of times, then I'll just start to like it? No, nah, you can listen to it a lot of times and hate it really bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, if it sucks, it sucks. I mean, uh, like, like, I remember... Um, Keep the Keisha Cole record, Love, yes. right? And and um, um, Star and Buck Wild had their show in New York when that record was hot. Yeah. And they used to play that record every morning. I would listen to the show every morning. Yeah. And I hated it. The first 30 or 40 times I heard it, I'm like, are they playing this as a joke? Like, this chick can barely sing. Like, what is happening? And something happened, and like the 40th time I heard it, I'm like, no, this is genius. <laughs> this is raw pain and singing and, and and but I didn't I couldn't I needed a ton of listens to get to there because you were trying to you were listening in the wrong kind of way. Yeah. You were listening musically. You weren't listening with the heart. That's a heart record. The first time I put on Nina Simone and I listened for like 30 seconds. I was 22. Yeah. And I listened to it for like 30, 60 seconds, and it was way too melancholy. I'm like, no, mm -mm, I can't. <laughs> I am not. And, and and what I would say, I am not emotionally equipped <laughs> to deal with it. And then a year later, I came back to it. was like, okay, now I can, now I love her. Now I can deal with these records. But, you know, like she is that, that place. That's yeah. hard. Yeah, I, I think music is definitely different today. And there's things that are that come out that can be questionable in terms of like, okay, what is it in that? But I still listen. And I still try to see what is it about that? Is it something that's catchy about it? I still listen for that. I try to find out what is it that that they love. So okay, last thing, I, I want to make the phone ring, right? Because you know people are going to listen to this. Managers, A and R's, whatever. Who is working today? Who's not calling you yet? Who should call you? Because if they called you, you'd be like, "Oh yeah, I'll work with him. I'll work with her." We said SZA. You love SZA. I mean, uh, I think that um, that's a hard thing to say. I mean, like I've I've already said it before um, on another thing uh, with with Drake. Talk, 
love to work with Drake because I think that Drake is is an amazing songwriter. It's a good vibe. You know? To you, and that's like so. I think one day we'll we'll work together. Um, I think that there's so many things. Uh, just so many things. Somebody may I may not have thought of. I mean, I think of in this moment, but my mind is always open, and I'm always like, you know, okay, I'll look, check it out and see whether there's something I can bring to the table. It always, for me, it always has to be whether I can bring something to the table. Yeah, you know, um, if I don't feel like I can, then I don't, I don't just want to do it for the sake of doing it. And I think that um, that's what that's what it all comes down to, whether creative minds can come together and, and make something go a step further. Yeah. I don't want to just come in there and just do a song, say I did a song. I don't want to be, nor do I want to be the the fourteenth person on the song writing it either. I yeah. Mean, you know. I I want to actually help create and be a part of that process. So who else beside Drake? Um I'm I'm blanking right now. <laughs> um, at this particular point. I think um um you, you know, I, I do work with Bruno. I love working with Bruno. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the weekend, you know, um, I think he's a, he's an incredible artist. Yeah. Um, his voice is great and he's a great, great songwriter. Yeah. Um, I think, um, and I don't want to go to, you know, right now I'm thinking, I'm not thinking, I'm just picking out the big ones. Sure. Cause, Cause there's other artists that I'm sure that, sure. you know, um, I would probably work with as well. Um, but at this point, it's just, uh, it's all about, you know, whether you vibe with it and, and just and be creative together. Yeah. So that, that leaves the door wide open. 